what I've learned, and I'll be very open and share. It's like, no, that's not the case. You can give a 250% and you still will fail. Like financially, the numbers don't lie. They're like, yo, you suck. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Design Exchange Podcast. I'm Thomas Grove, and with me today is Tom Nguyen Cao. Yes. Tom uh, is from the United States. From Vietnam. Grew up in the States. That's how I like to phrase it now. Grew up in the States, has returned to Vietnam, uh, geez, a long time ago now. Yeah, uh, um, 11 years ago. And, you know, I first got acquainted to you through our friend Tomo. Yeah. Um, but at the time, you were running the the bean store. The yeah, bean yeah, store, yeah. That's good memory. That which was a tofu based or soybean based restaurant. Yes, restaurant, cafe. Yeah, a lot of desserts. It's actually like a street over, parallel. Does it still exist? Is it still running? No, it's no. Um, stopped three, almost three years ago. Yeah. Uh, after your involvement with the bean store, you went to Singapore. Yeah. Um, and now you're mostly back here, but I still see you traveling to Singapore a lot. Yeah. So yeah. what's what's going on with Singapore? Um, Singapore is like always the base. Uh, that That's like where our company's registered, like a holding company. That's one thing. And then for, the, for a while, I was um, distributing the Clipper tea you saw. Uh, I don't know if you saw it down there. Anyway, that's from Singapore. That's a Singapore brand. It's our, well, it's, yeah, it's my friend's uh, family company. So that's part of the reason it's like back and forth. We're sitting today inside your cafe, Saigon Siblings. Yes. We're only yeah. seeing one angle, but it's no, a very true. stylish cafe. How long Thank have you, you been kind of running this cafe? This, I mean, as you know, we recently rebranded, but the cafe itself has been three, will be three years in January. So, yeah, for this location, three years. One thing that's interesting about this cafe is that you have on this kind of ground floor level and this mezzanine level, you've got seating for the cafe. Yeah. And then above us, you have something like eight Airbnb rentals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of, when you took over this space, what was, was this your original goal for it or did it? change over time not at all uh if i rewind i didn't even this was not even the reason i came back at first and then it was just kind of serendipitous like the timing i because this used to be I, I think i shared with you my grandfather's home i used to visit it was it happened to be in a great location and then my aunt was in this space downstairs this whole street used to be furniture street you know as, as you know in vietnam like or saigon specifically too streets are really you go to a specific street for a specific item, right? It's like computer street and furniture street. So this used to be just like furniture street. And then here was a mattress shop. And it was like a pretty, what I call like a dead space. So upstairs, I mean, it's a pretty big shop house. And there was like three people in this home at any given time. So for me, it was always about like, um, I like to say it's like, Oh, I learned from a friend in Jakarta uh, who's, who, uh, as he phrases it, they've done a lot of projects. It's like, like bringing to life dead spaces, you know? And that's how I felt this was afterwards. Like once the family started leaving, my cousins moved out, uh, my grandfather passed. And then it was just like nothing of this place and then a mattress shop. And so we, I just had the idea and I've been, I started using Airbnb and I was like, oh man, this is the timing. This is early, sorry, this is late 2016. Um, when we actually launched, but early 2016, I, that's when I kind of had the idea. And I was like, all right, uh, let's, this is like perfect. And the rooms were kind of set up already like that. And so I was like, man, I mean, it's almost set up like already like a bed and breakfast. You know, each room has, has had, had a washroom. So that, that already, obviously from a business perspective, I was like, oh, save costs there. So uh, we, yeah, we came in and I just, I really want to do the Airbnbs. This one, I wasn't sure what to do on the ground floor at that point. So I was like co-working, you know, that was kind of getting coming up and I was like, but it's kind of small. 
Um, I did again. Yeah, I did the bean store before. I, I was also like, ah, do I want to operate the food and beverage again? It's, it's awesome. It's very fulfilling, but a lot of variables. And then, but it happened that my sister had relocated here too, and her brother-in-law. I'm uh, sorry, and her husband, my brother-in-law, and they love coffee. So it was like just we made use of the space down here. You know, um, that's kind of how the the story went. So it was all just kind of went with went with the go with the flow. Your sister makes the best chocolate chip cookies in Saigon. <laughs> That's true. And That's true. I'm special orders. a little sad to see that I don't see any downstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's funny. It's you know, it's it's like it's like Singapore famous too. Got got guests from Singapore buying like bulk back. There's special ingredients in there. <laughs> I can't divulge. No, we're we're gonna bring it back. We've been like going through so much change with the kitchen and then like the rebranding. So we're yeah, we're we're coming out with our goals come out with like new packaging and all that. So we just kind of halted everything. It's fine. Yeah. That, that is why you didn't see the cookies, the magic cookies. There's nothing. <laughs> they're not space cookies. No, they're, 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 they're just chocolate chip cookies. They're just chocolate but chip they're cookies. They're very good. Uh, like, and just the right amount of sea salt, you know? Right. Yeah. Just the right amount of saltiness, the right amount of chewiness, the right mm-hmm. amount of hardness, yeah. you know? You find most chocolate chip cookies are either too crispy yeah. Or too chewy. And, and kind of getting that middle ground is where it's at. That And that's like a metaphor for business, just getting everything, you know, right? So and, and for the record, there's no drugs in the cookies. I'm totally joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make them laugh. Yeah. Uh, and I found out this morning that you recorded 12 episodes of a podcast. Yeah, yeah, we did. Un, unpublished. <laughs> So, the, so the the plan is to uh, release them after you're dead. Yeah, that's that's like the inside joke between um, Jiren and I, who's he's, he's the other host. Uh, we were and we, we've we've done a few sessions like this, never this I would say professionally set up, and then and then he was when he was in the Bay Area or he was in Singapore. We also did it uh, virtually too. It's it's just a way for us to practice, or especially for me, I think, just to just have discussions and and just have topics, random topics we discuss. I love it. Because I, I I listen to podcasts. I started listening to podcasts religiously when I moved to um, Singapore the first time in 20, uh, 2013. Because uh, the commute on the train, so the MRT, so I was it was just perfect, you know. So it's like you're like maximizing time reading mm-hmm. or audiobooks in this case or podcasts. Yeah, I n- I never got into it in the commute route. Or the gym route. Okay. You know, I hear a lot of people listen to podcasts yep. in the gym, listen to on the commute. My commute, for the most part, has been riding a motorbike, so I kind of want to be very present. Yes, I agree. Um, <laughs> that's, not, that's not safe. Yeah. Although I do it sometimes here in one ear, if, if I ride a scooter, sometimes. So my main way of consuming them is uh, to, to fall asleep. Oh, that's not good. Uh, it's it's working because it? like okay. I'll catch about half an hour of it before I pass out, and then the next night I can rewind and continue where okay, I left that off. Works for you. Cause do you know Jim Quick? No. Do you follow him? He's like that super famous Chinese American guy that celebrities hire, everyone hires. Like the whole, I don't know the production company behind, of course Marvel. That's it. That did X Men. They hired this guy. To, he's he's considered like a learn a hacker for learning, and he helps people like them memorize their scripts, anything. So I have to bring that up because I was doing the same thing. I was reading books before I went to sleep, but then you associate that behavior with like falling asleep. He was proving that. So that that's I wanted to highlight that. So if you keep listening to podcasts right before you sleep, you're associating that behavior. So every time you will fall asleep. So I stop reading right before I go to sleep now because then I associate as I start reading, I'll start to fall asleep, and it oh, might be an awesome book because uh, you know we're, we learn everything is learned right our behavior. So it's like you start to associate. So I did stop that like. Six months ago. I think you need some kind of ritual to fall asleep. Yeah, you do. You do know? you want it? I guess the question is, do you want it to be that? I'm I'm okay with that. Okay. It's working for me. All right. Because I want <laughs> I want to be wide awake consuming everything when I'm like podcast, listen to podcasts. So I am that typical commuter and then like at the gym, like putting in a deadlift and then just like, ah, uh, Tim Ferriss, <laughs> Joe Rogan. <laughs> yeah. Those two are pretty, pretty big in the space. Oh, huge. We were um, just talking about that yesterday, how much they monetize. My current setup uh, in terms of microphones is based on Tim Ferriss's setup, what he recommended. Okay. I didn't quite do it exactly like he said, though. And um, he recommended the SM58. 
Okay. And I'm I... using the Beta 58A. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a better microphone, but in my tests so far, I'm getting more handling noise. Let me give an example of that quickly. Oh. And right. you shouldn't hear that. I'm not handling it a lot. Okay. I'm still trying to debug this and figure out how I can fix that situation because I, I feel bad for anyone who's listening to it and kind of being forced to hear that sound. Okay. Um, well, just before we started recording, we were talking about the Naked Director. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The Naked Director. I really enjoyed that. It's a Thanks. Netflix uh, series. Japanese produced Netflix series about the Japanese porn industry and how it was transformed. I assume if I can say from like the whole censored to uncensored movement or just. Yeah. And just from, um, geez, what were they? They, they used like different terminologies. Um, okay. But more like from eroticism to porn basically. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Well um, said. But. What's interesting for me in that show is just the guy's ambition and drive and his hustle, basically. Yeah. You know? Uh, he keeps, in, in the story, the guy keeps coming up with various roadblocks and he's always finding ways to pivot and punch through and, you know, yeah, no, it's, uh, survive. It is. It's like a really, ins you're right. It's like really inspiring for any, I mean, at the end of the day, any entrepreneur, it's like, you're right. It's like he didn't give up. It's like that Elon Musk conviction, you know, although he came before Elon. But, you know, it's like, yo, I'm not giving up no matter what, even his partners and all the hiccups they had. Yeah. Anyways, very entertaining story. And if you're a fan of pornography, you will definitely appreciate seeing some of the background uh, story of yeah. how the JAV industry developed. Yeah. Like, Jap yeah, Japanese culture, JAV. Yeah. I enjoy, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I enjoyed a lot of the scenes. <laughs> right. Not that we would not that we would know. Yeah, yeah. I I just I it was very educational. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna people are gonna hear this later. It's like it's awkward silence, like that we understood each other without saying Yeah, some crickets in the background. <laughs> and some moaning. Some crickets and some moaning. <laughs> oh, you should add that. Yeah. Can you add that? I can make a moan right now. Yeah. Oh no! Don't do that. No. Not. It's a. It's a family. It's a family yeah, cat. Family thing. affair. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a nice. I like that. My hand's super shaky though. So. I'm gonna zoom out. Um, you can't yeah, really I'm, tell with my current color balance, but it's basically a purple drink. <laughs> yeah. You watch Dave Chappelle? Uh, yeah. Because you said purple drink. It's purple drink. But yeah. oh, anyway, sorry. All right. That's a, no. I mean, that drink is purple. Yeah, yeah. And then Dave Chappelle, who has a skit. No? No, I don't know okay, that Okay, never mind. Purple drink. Like, all right, that's a whole another story. From the Chappelle show? Yeah, from the Chappelle show. Just about black folks and purple drink. Cause they couldn't afford grape juice. That was the joke he would do. Oh, okay. So, yeah. They yeah. would call it purple drink because it was just powder, like Kool-Aid. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's kind of a little bit like a Fanta grape. Also, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Grape, yeah, exactly. Grape soda instead of actual grape juice. Yeah, we thought with the branding, uh, what we wanted to do was like just we're rebranding everything and also the menu and some of the drinks, just make it more with that whole vibe and the brand of Saigon Siblings now. So like this is going to be like Tam's Taro drink. <laughs> like that will be the name. Tam's what, Taro Latte. So where, what is, when you're talking about the, the branding and the, the style of Saigon Siblings, what do you really mean? Um, what I mean by that, and this is like really coming from the heart and I love to tell this story. It's like when we created, my partner and I in the past created the bean store, uh, like the concept, the food, the brand voice, the branding, everyone, when they walked in, they didn't even know me yet. Or and the friends that uh, some people went there, didn't even know that it was my spot. And they were like, yo, this is so, this is so you, that like you could just, you can just get it, you know? Like, because uh, there's a lot of personal touches. It's like a passion project, you know. Um, I mean, it happened to be, that concept happened to be very profitable. It's like, but it was a passion project. And so, you know, we recently rebranded uh, from Bits Etera to, to now Saigon Siblings. And I think it's just, for, for, for me, it's a much more meaningful brand. And then now we're making even 
because before, you know, we had a lot of partners involved and it was, it was obviously operating in two different spaces. It, was, it created a lot of complications and I wish them all the best of luck. And then for us, it just makes it much easier for us to really have creative freedom and I could really build the brand and the direction the way that I want. So is the other location uh, closed or is it still the Etcetera Cafe? No, we, we shut that. We had two other locations in the past like year and a half. So yeah, we, part of the rebranding, we just decided to just close it because this is, and we can start back uh, as, a, as we call it our flagship, right? So this is where it all started. And we have another brand, right? Modern Hustle. But that's, people always ask, why don't you brand everything the same? But you know, when you have different ideas and you have different, I'm not, we're not trying to build a franchise here. So it's like just different concepts and I want to work with different folks. So it just makes more sense. But long winded answer to why Saigon Siblings, like when I said the, the, the vibe or the mood, is because the whole idea, I love the names because this, my partner is my sister too. And yeah, so we're siblings. So it's your business partner. Yes. Yeah. Business partner. Yes. No. Um, yes. <laughs> Incest, Just no. To clarify, yeah, no, no incest, no incest. About yeah, that. yeah, no incest here. Um, so we, uh, yeah, so you know, I relocated. I was sharing the story. I during the break, I relocated here, partly because her husband uh, and and she did, wanted to be here. Uh, they kind of wanted to follow me here. So I was in Singapore at the time, so I decided to head back too. So that's that's how it all came together, you know. So. We're going back to a brand. We, we created this brand a while ago, but we never did much with it. I had like an Instagram account, a couple hundred followers, and it was just sitting there because we use it as like our catering brand and just like our projects. Were the, were the cookies under that brand? Yeah, you know, so it was like yeah. all of our stuff that we're selling in other cafes or just experimenting. So we we're like, a lot of people liked the name. They loved the name and they were like, hey, why don't you, why don't you just brand it this? And we're like, all right. So we work with one of our brand partners. He helped us, um, Simon from OWL, to like come up with like a whole concept. So we got a lot of things planned. So I'm really excited about it. It's just, it's more us. It's our brand voice. It's just more authentic, I think. And when something's meaningful to you, and and when I say like really meaningful to you, you're you're just gonna have a lot more fun. I think you hear it a lot, right? Then you you think about it differently, and you can work on it with with less stress. You know. You've d been doing a lot of entrepreneurial things for the last ten years. Um, the last. Yeah, you can. I mean, you could go even longer, but yeah, I've always been like hustling. But I, I mean, I did corporate as you know most of my life, but I always had side projects and invested in various things. But my bug, the entrepreneurial bug, started when I was like twelve. I've been hustling since then. So what I want to ask is, uh, when do you feel it's that a business or a partnership or an idea has run its course and it's time to kind of give up on it and move on to the next thing. Man, that is, see, and that's where I think you got the real talented folks. Like they, they really have like the true talent or, or that skill. That's what it takes to be like a leader, but also just to be a successful businessman or a woman. Uh, I, I'm still figuring that out. I am. Cause like you were saying earlier, I want to talk about like the naked director, right? Like that takes a lot of conviction, but you also, the issue I have now with entrepreneurship and like the Gary V's, well, he's mixed on things. I, I do like his message, but like you have now the age of Instagram, everyone's just like celebrating entrepreneurship and success, which is awesome. But, and then there's no talk about how many failures there's going to be. And I've had a lot of friends fall into depression because of that, because you know, you're, we're all chasing this. And if you don't, you hear it a lot, if you don't enjoy the journey, you it's, it's just not a, if you just look focused on this destination, the success. Yeah. But the point here is you always hear people say it too, like F it, like no plan B, like there's only plan A I'm going for it and it's gonna, I'm going to make it happen and I'm going to do it. And then what I've learned and I'll be very open to share. It's like, no, that's not the case. You can give a 250% and you still will fail. Like financially, the numbers don't lie. They're like, yo, you suck. You know, and that hits you hard if you're very type A, if you're very ambitious and you just think you're going all in and you're just going to make it happen and it's just going to work out. And I learned the hard way because I think I've been fortunate, close friends to me I've shared. I mean, up until 30, I've, I think everything I've worked on, I've just, I realized how lucky I was and everything that worked out in my businesses and corporate. Now for the first time, I've, I've faced like definitely um, 
like like that book we just saw right the subtle art not giving a fuck that was perfect read for me because it was just like your know, life is just this suffering and there's gonna be more of it and not to put a negative spin but that is that that creates the story too because now i can sit here and i have a billion stories for you we don't have enough time but it's like man the past three years since i decided to go just full on with all my projects it's been it's been one hell of a journey um i think sometimes I'm, I'm, i dive i dig yeah i digress a bit but the point was you're asking like yeah, at what point, like, do you know when relationships sour or kind of business is done? And that to answer that again is like, I don't know. And and I think you need to be realistic and do have an exit. I think the, the I heard, I forget which podcast I was listening to. And he said it best. And I realized I didn't even think about that. They were like, make a business plan. I mean, believe in your business, but make a business plan preparing to fail. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, that hit me hard. Because all the time I make business plans, I'm like, yo, this is how we're going to rock it. This is how we're going to enter the market. This is how we're going to kill it. This product category or this service or anything. I was totally wrong because it is about, yes, you, you, you have a plan and you sell it and you market it to investors. But your business plan should have an exit. That's so important. That's what I've learned the hard way. It should always, there should always be options. Because, again, it's not like for, <laughs> again, we don't sell it. We don't show so many of the failures. I still think we don't. They have these fail nights and all that, but still everyone's so focused on like, yo, you got to go all in. Like you're going to make it happen. Quit your job and do it. Like I totally am against that advice now. When the people that have spearheaded a lot of these things like podcasts, like blogging, you know, we, we only, what do they call it? Like success bias yeah, or whatever, success right? Success bias, yeah. So Tim Ferriss talks a lot about that. You only really hear from the success stories. So it looks like everybody who's doing the thing is a success. Yeah. And then- you know, even if you were to look at some of the big ones like uh, Seth Godin, Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, yeah. they're all arguably quite successful. So like, hey, I'm doing a podcast and it's a success. So and then as even if they don't say it as an audience, you're like, well, they did it. So maybe if I become a vlogger or a game streamer, I will be as popular as the ones that I watch. Yeah. And it's just like that South Park sketch with the underpants gnomes. I'm trying to recall. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. It was but quite a meme for a while. So it's like, step one, make underpants. Step two, question mark. Yeah, yeah. Step three, profit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that is so true. Oh, I love that one. Like, uh, yeah, let's skip all of the stuff that actually matters, which is the freaking execution, which is, you realize 99% of it. And even that's why I'm, I'm very humbled by everything that I've learned. It's like, no. And that's what separates everyone. It's that execution. Because we all have ideas. I love when I'm sitting with people and they're like, oh, man, that guy stole my idea. Like, look, he, I had that idea. I'm like, nobody gives a shit. You didn't do anything with <laughs> Yeah, like everyone has ideas. Like, that's what it comes down to. Even I, I have so many ideas and we don't execute on it. Somebody else does it. And we're like, ah, damn it. We're just slow, you know? Again, it's because they've set up such a great, for, for this kind of business, especially hospitality, F&B, you have a strong... And I know we don't, but if you have a strong core, a strong back office, and it takes a lot of effort, and then it's kind of a, it's springboard, it's a system. And then from there, you just, you know, that's how you just generate a machine. Um, we're, we're still learning that too. I don't, ex I can guess what a back office is, but I don't actually know. Like, because I'm not uh, yeah. in that industry. So what is a back office? It's like when you, I mean, I, you've worked corporate. So it's like any back office is your, like your core functions, like your HR, your finance, your accounting, your marketing. Uh, and just more important, the operations, like things are, it's usually first that just those core functions in any organization. And it just means, and it's just systems are in place, the SOPs, the standard operating procedures and any kind of business that matters so much. I give us an F, especially we went through so many changes and ups and downs because originally my strategy was to just expand as fast as possible, create the demand, and then the back office must fulfill it. There's two ways of going about it and expanding a business or... It could be you build everything first, you have a strong bank office, you invest first, you're going to lose right? money up front. You're investing a lot, and then from there you have a launch pad for everything, you know, which is, there, there's two ways to go about it. I, I, I'm in no place to say, I mean, which one's better. I mean, you could see now some companies are doing so well. I mean, Google is kind of a prime example of that, I guess, right? At a, at a really large level, they, their core functions, they're everything, they have, they have a machine in place. And now you can see the whole Alphabet company, right? They're just like spewing out products all the time. They can fail and they just don't care because they already have their cash cows. And that's, I think that's the goal of any like major organization. If you're 
trying to really build concepts, especially in F and B, food and beverage. When I say F and B, um, I still have a lot to learn. I mean, we have partly we we lack resources, right? And it goes back to the other point. It's like, uh, man, comparison is like the biggest thief of joy. And which is related to, like you said, this whole success bias. We see all this, but we don't even know like what everyone's resources are, right? If I And my friends try to tell me like, hey, stop doing that because I do it a lot. I'm guilty of it. I'm like, man, look at them. And then you find out, oh, well, you know, they have a family business that generates like 100000 a month. And now they can pour money in this amazing concept that they're doing and they can bleed. And I'm not making excuses. And it's, you should find a balance of, it's not even trying to make excuses. Oh, this is why I, did, I failed. But it's more of like, hey, just don't even compare so much. And you got to look at what resources you have and you try to play to that, you know? In the uh, movie industry, there's this concept called, um, I think it's called launching big. Yeah. And the idea there is the movie might not be that good, but you put so much marketing hype into it yeah. that you're really counting on recouping your costs in the first two days yeah. before the reviews come out. Okay. You know, before people have a chance to tell their friends, oh, it's not worth seeing, they've already gone kind ah, of hype. Gotcha. Got, yeah. Um, and it's a little, maybe it's a little different, but like the the last time I was in Saigon, I didn't see this uh, Guta Cafe. Yeah. You seen it. And now I see them on every corner. Yeah. And yeah. You, that happens like year after year, there'll be a new cafe that's on every corner. Yeah. And, uh, and I have to imagine that their business strategy is we're going to be everywhere, so people will think that we are the shit. So yeah. they'll come to us, you know, and then we will be the shit. Exactly. And that, I find in Saigon that I can't speak for other markets. Like, you would know better. I would love to hear about, like, Tokyo or in Osaka. But that, cons- that strategy can work. You know, I think that's how Subway, the Subway story, too. Like, they were not doing well, but they kept expanding, taking a, just a, a big bet. And it happened. People were like, oh, you know, it's that, it's that perspective. Uh, it's just the perception. Oh, man, they must be doing well. Let's check it out. You know, they're at – and that's kind of the whole Starbucks model, right, of just being at every corner or 7-Eleven in Hong Kong. It's like every corner. It's like 4,000 7-Elevens in Hong Kong. It's, it's, it's like that strategy. And, and, yeah, with Guta, that's what you see too. Like, that's one of many concepts, right, They just – they go hard. They open a lot of locations. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you could sit there and do the numbers. I, a lot of concepts here in F&B, I mean, the, the community talks like are bleeding, right? But they just have, like I, I shared with you, they have deep pockets from other uh, from other businesses, right? So a lot of people move in F&B that I know of too. Yeah, there are serious business outfits that are generating t- tons of income, like um, – the group of that that owns uh, four peas, you know, pizza four peas, yeah. right? I mean, they they got investment from like Ipudo. Now they brought in Ipudo, so that's like serious money coming, and they are generating. Their traffic is insane. You could do the numbers, but U- there's also a lot of F and B. Sorry, Ipudo, Ipudo, yeah, the ramen spot, the, the famous ramen chain. Oh, I'm oh, I thought you were not okay. familiar with it, but they just opened here, but they received like twenty million dollars investment here. That's that is a. As you, I mean, anywhere that's a lot of money, but think about in, in Vietnam for food and beverage investments, you know? So, uh, but back to your point, yeah, like the Guta, like that popped up. I'm not sure exactly, yeah, even how they're doing. Like milk tea was a crazy, crazy craze, right? Um, and it's been dying down. And just like any industry, you have a consolidation in the market. Like you can see, and they were just selling the brands, right? Like that was the, you, you see a lot of things pop up also because they were just, they'll sell you the brand for like 10 grand and here's the, you know, another 20 grand set up everything for you. Oh, it's like a franchise thing. Yeah, you know, pretty scammy actually. It's like following like the China model. So you have your friends opening. So it looks really successful and everyone's jumping on, on it. But who makes all the money? The brand owner, the, the person that came up with the brand and they just sold there to got, like you just said, they already got their money back, right? They got, they got 10 grand on each location plus another 20 to set up whatever. It's like, boom, and then press royalties, which they never cared for anyways, right? They got the money up front. They knew it wasn't going to last. You know, it's just the hype, the craze. And now, because it's so hot, everyone just, if there sees any concepts that kind of takes off, money is just going at it, you know? Um, I wish I was able to do that too, actually. Yeah, <laughs> but some, our concepts weren't that scalable. Sometimes I feel that I'm, there's parts of business or life that I'm really dumb about. Okay. And one of those things would be like, franchising okay. or timeshares. Oh yeah, yeah. These kind of things like 
if you are a business actually and you, and you want to expand, that's a good way to get other people to yeah to carry OPM. your risk for you yeah right. But OPM from my own mind, that's not the way to do it. You sh- like in my own very linear worldview you're like first you should make it small and sustainable and then when you have enough profit you can open a second location yeah you know and just grow very because you're 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 old school i'm not saying that's that's a bad thing it's how i thought about things too i'm like you know making money takes time and being patient and you know but then you get like so caught up in the world now by just opening instagram everyone's like yo i made a million dollars in one minute you know because of this whole tech craze right you can you have scale that on another level Right. So the scale. So, and we're, I mean, you're kind of in tech. I don't, I don't know. As I recall. So money is way fa- like the F and B retail is always a slower game, right? You just can't scale at the same level. Sorry. Making a, making a smoothie. You know, we're in a cafe. So it is the ambiance. Yeah, it is. It adds to that vibe. You know, when I work, I actually, uh, I listen to noisily and this is going to sound really dumb. I'm in a cafe I have my headphones on and I'm listening to a cafe noise, like as if I'm in a cafe. If I'm when I'm traveling, just it's a, called Noisly, the app. So you can feel like you're at home. <laughs> it's weird. It's like so I'm listening to cafe background noise in a cafe. It could be a Starbucks too, and I'll have my earphones on listening to cafe noise. Why don't you just not have anything in and listen to the actual cafe? I don't know. It became a habit. It's so weird. Somehow that's less distracting. I've been doing the opposite, where I I got noise canceling headphones, and. Uh, I could be at home or I could be at a cafe and I've just got the noise canceling on just to put me in my own mental space and not okay. yeah, somewhere else. Can I hear them later? I want to test. Oh, yeah, sure. I can't work in silence. That's another, another topic about work styles and stuff, but I cannot work in silence. I need some kind of uh, background noise. But I love music, but it can't have lyrics. Right. Because you'll sing along, you know, my brain. So I love like electronic or yeah, like lo-fi like lo-fi yeah it's perfect yeah 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 okay i just gave a look so i'm like oh must yeah, be... she likes lo-fi oh hell yeah lo-fi is perfect for working lo-fi hip-hop just lo-fi beats we're um yeah where were we i don't know they're making another drink that's good for business uh, we're talking a lot about business and you're oh you're we're talking about the old school style you mentioned about you should build one location if it's if it's a brick and mortar and you make profit or or it could be a product right and you've 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 made your money back and then you take that and you invest you can but remember for and that's what i've learned for people who my mentors who grow at way larger scales that have like 30 outlets that are making millions you know they're like sure but remember time is money <laughs> right right you you know, so that's what i mean by it went back to what you said and i'm still figuring that out it's a balance man and i guess if you get it the, the right mix for you like for Thomas and I do it for me, and then we're just going to do great in our own respective fields because it's, it's not a race. It's, it's like it is a marathon kind of thing because if you do keep thinking like you got to make money fast, I think it won't. I learned the hard way too because I think I got caught up. So it is a balance of like, okay, what, what works for it? Are your, your, I mean, there's so many things, variables, right? The market timing, your product, how are you going to market, how many competitors? It's just, oh, man, there's a list. How's the, how's the economy doing? That's a whole nother one, right? I mean, um, or if we're doing, in our case, like hospitality, right? We had a lot of rooms before, but then competition went nuts. Like everybody started renting out rooms. And also you had, you had weather conditions, which matters a lot in hospitality. Like the rainy season, then occupancy drops by half, you know? So there are just so many things that play. And that's why people, as I was referring to OPM, I learned from uh, Robert Kiyosaki, Richard Dad, Poor Dad. It's like other people's money and that's the whole idea of why they people do franchising you can just grow way faster right and then flip it so um so it depends always and then i had another mentor ask me a great question i couldn't answer it we we're sitting right here and when we we're at four locations and he felt we were a bit messy he was just like so what's your exit like what do you want um you just need to be clear about that then you know your because that will dictate how you you scale and everything. He's like, why are you scaling even then? If you want to be a lifestyle business, what do you want? You know? So there were so many questions. And I think this time around, that's why less is more now. I feel great. Now we're just down in terms of locations. We just got two. And then we have many projects and businesses. Uh, hustle. Modern hustle. And district four. And then we just have this now in terms of like brick and mortar locations. And obviously we have other businesses behind that. And I plan to 
scale of, and and we're cleaning up house and we'll we'll like reorganize and see how we expand from here you know but i want to take it also from a scale perspective um i do want to do more b2b work like we sell our our co- our house blend coffee to other cafes and we're looking at other ways to to do it because i think from i love building out spaces and creating concepts if i had the resources to continue to do that i don't to have to to opt to continue to just uh, inherit so much risk as you were saying earlier right so and that's why franchising or other things could be a model because i can't just drop 60 grand every time to open a location you know like where this whole one was even way more right if it's if it's including the, the the bed and breakfast concept so i just want to look at how do we what other businesses we can do that because when i think about every time i open a location i joke a lot with the team it's like all right by the time i've opened i've paid 10 grand for an espresso machine i bought how much coffee I've played for like pain, all this, like all these guys have already collected their checks, you know? And then now, like you said, now it's my turn to go get my 60 grand back and then some and make sure I beat the bank rate. Um, so a lot of my talk is just from, I've learned from a lot of mentors and just through work too, you know? They've made me question so much. I realized they're like, this is cute. It's a passion project. You're barely like, you're not making that much. And it's like, okay, so it's, you know, um, or the guy from Shark Tank, Kevin O'Leary, he's like, it's a hobby until it makes some serious money. <laughs> and I love that because so many people call themselves like entrepreneurs business. It's like, nah, you got a hobby. And that project is a project. That's not a business. Like, and I'm not saying that to toot my own horn, but man, to really think about what it means to have a business and run a business is like different than this little fun project you have, you know, uh, or hobby. And then when you think of it like that, it humbles you, all of us too. I, uh, in my own business, um, you know, we had this, Kickstarter and it was a modest success, but, uh, I got burnt out at the end of it Okay, and I fell into depression. Uh, oh, man, we, yeah. we're going to go there. Well, no, we can. You know, it's kind of why I started doing this podcast because it okay. was just this thing that I can do one episode and see the progress of an episode. Okay. You know, as opposed to a Kickstarter, which is months of preparation and, right. and years of like a year of design and months of preparation yeah. and then months of logistics. Right. It's like a real slog just like to get this. to the finish okay. line. And and why do you say, I mean, were you seriously clinically diagnosed or you just felt as if uh, you had a lot of the signs and people told you? I wasn't clinically I was self-diagnosed. But, yeah. Yeah. And, but, uh, yeah. <clears throat> no, but it, I mean, it's. I don't, I don't need a doctor to tell me yeah, how, yeah, that, you don't. how I'm You're, feeling. It's a good point to bring up. I also, I mix on what you need to see a doctor for too. I haven't been to a doctor for a while. That's why I told you I, I don't want to because of my lifestyle. <clears throat> so, um, but like, yeah, about the whole depression. Because I, I had a few friends that were, one was clinically diagnosed and she was brave enough to talk about it and wrote a Medium article. Um, and the, the thing is, people think... And I think I think that's why it just shows you like the issues in our society now. Man, we got a lot of things to resolve as as like humans, you know, because her business is actually doing really well. They had like half a million in the bank cash. Like this is out of Singapore. She's I could show you the article after. They were doing well, and she fell into depression. You know, I don't know if you watched the most recent Dave Chappelle skit too, because he sticks and stones. Yes, and it talked. He talked about Anthony Bourdain and how he was like, yo. Think about it. I'm Anthony Bourdain. I'm on a show, No Reservations. I'm traveling the world and I'm eating food from around the world and I'm just cool as hell. And I still decided to kill myself. Yeah. And we're not even laughing at it because we're like, yo, what the hell is wrong with society then? And there's a lot of people suffering. And uh, when you said that, it made me like have compassion for you because I, the past few years, I, I mean, people close to me, I don't mind sharing, even if you're publishing this, I, I think I went through the same. I wasn't clinically diagnosed, but damn. I was set off when my, um, who you met way back, but my former business partner and an ex-girlfriend passed away. Um, I still, when you mentioned it again now, I had forgotten because it's. Yeah, that was December 2017. So it's been what? It will be, damn. It's just, uh, you you don't, you don't, uh, when people die that young. You yeah. know, if you weren't really close to them, yeah, you forget that they died because, like, how that doesn't it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Right? Yeah, you you get yeah. So that, but that, and then business was starting to go down that time too. So it's like Murphy's Law, and that's when I learned about that. It just went downhill for me mentally. 
Um, and there was a lot of substance abuse on the way. That's when I, a lot of signs of escapism and people close to me like, man, like it's okay to do something for fun recreationally, but when you're, it's a constant escape, you know, then it's like, okay, you got to ask yourself. Um, and it's funny how I used to be, see, the world will come back and just like, be like, F you. I remember how I used to be so judgmental when I was younger, like, you do drugs, <laughs> you know, it's like, and now you see what kind of suffering there is in the world and why people escape, you know? And, but that, that really, um, I'm now in hindsight, I think I'm, I'm definitely recovering, getting out of all that. And I'm appreciative at the same time, grateful that happened. And then the lesson there was also, I, th I think I mentioned to you up until 30, I don't think I was ever like, I never knew what really failure was. Like I got a scholarship. I graduated university early. I got like expat job when I came out here, like everything was just like on the ups, you know? And then every woman I was with was just amazing. And then I hit this, this life and it's like what happened recently and all that. And you're reminded, yes, they always say like, yo, failure is temporary. You know, like failure is temporary. That's what kills us going, right? All those motivational quotes, like failure is temporary, pain is temporary. But then you got to remember on the flip side, success is also temporary. And that's where I, got, I forgot. I never even learned that because I thought, no, you can only go up. You mm -hmm. forget like, yo, no, you're, you know, success is also temporary. So it's like. Yeah, I think part of the uh, problem also is we either we have expectations of ourselves, we have perceived societal expectations of ourselves. We wonder about our parents or our girlfriends or our children's uh, expectations of us yeah. as well. And um, you know. The narrative is that we should be striving for some kind of success, and um, but you know when you end up reading a book like the the subtle, subtle, art. subtle art of giving a fuck, yeah, of not giving a of, fuck. of, of not uh, or of <laughs> either way, right? Yeah, yeah. of yeah. giving a fuck or not giving yeah, a yeah. fuck, uh, and you, I don't know. There, it's I have a a lot of b background in Eastern philosophy, like Taoism and Zen okay. Buddhism. And uh, when I don't necessarily have something going on that day, like I can be okay with that. I could just be okay not doing anything. Okay. But no one else around me is okay with that. They'll yeah. say, hey, what did you do today? Exactly. And then I'm like, uh, I didn't really do anything. I'm, I'm the same way though. And then I feel really guilty like now that I have this external influence, I feel bad right. about it. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's how it is, right? And that's the whole Steve Jobs thing about dogma and it's like Stanford's commencement speech and all that. It's just like, and you know, my friend uh, who's like into like executive coaching and things and communication, he's, he sat me down and made me think about that too. He's like, you and I are sitting here. There's four people at this, at this conversation. Yeah, so there's, there's four people in the conversation there's you and then there's me and then there's how i think you perceive me and there's you thinking how i perceive you so there's always like four people I, you know so there's always two people within one like of what you're saying the expectations of what i think somebody perceives me blah 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 and that's uh that's hard to detach from but i feel like there's so many movements happening people are just sick of the status quo for so many things right and it's, everything's being disrupted that's what's scary and exciting where the world's going for me what like before you know you were like yo you got to go to school now it's like no there's like 18 year old youtubers making three million dollars a year so everything i feel is being flipped upside down and the old the old guard or the older folks and the old heads if you will is just like it, it's it's a lot of discomfort for people and you know people that have been I, monopolies if you will like uh now it doesn't like the whole student loan I'm digressing a lot, but you know, like I'm just, it makes me question all, everything, like, this whole thing about getting us in debt and going to school. Like now people are like, you know, I don't even need to go to school. We were, you know, being groomed for a paradigm. Yeah. That, that no longer works. That didn't exist anymore. Yeah, exactly. And, and it wasn't even that it was like several generations removed. Like when we were going to elementary school, we were being educated in the industrial age education system that was to train us to be salary men and factory workers. Yeah. Yeah. And really quickly after that, we had like 
dot com companies, web designers, these kinds of fields. But then we've done another leap after that, yeah. where we have YouTube stars and stuff. Yeah, and, you know, exactly. and, and so we haven't been able to keep up in terms of like an education system with the reality on the ground of you know how do you make money and what does it mean to contribute to society. Yeah. And there's just, my gosh, there's just so much content, so much content creation and all that too. Yeah. Like what does it, there's so much crap content too. Sorry. I have to say that. <laughs> most like, of the most popular content is kind of crappy. It is. It is. And there's a movement that says, stop making stupid people famous, but that just drives so much clicks. Right. And the algorithms behind it. And like when you open Instagram, like I, I'll admit it, like I'm on Instagram and I'm watching like fight videos. Cause I love watch. I love, I mean, I do Muay Thai and I love watching that stuff. It's like violent. It's either going to be violence or like anything related to sex, right. Or big booties on like Instagram and just like clicks <laughs> or some stupid like thing about some rapper that doesn't matter. Yeah. But man, that's what you're fed. And yeah. So, so there is some to tie, to kind of tie something you said earlier with something I said a little bit later, when you're, let's say, consuming content on the internet, are you in, are you just doing nothing and it's okay to do nothing? Or are you engaging in escapism because you're actually trying to avoid your current pain and your current exactly. obligations and it's, stuff? It's definitely the latter, right? I know that. And that's why you're, when we, before we even started, when I just saw you, I said I had to like stop everything and meditate. And I, I mean, I'll be, I'll be leaving Saigon soon and spending a lot of time traveling um, and working not in Saigon and so I because I think I got comfortable I just got so stressed here and got distracted but I do want to spend more time being proactive yeah like I grab like I have apps tracking my usage and stuff and I like for example I unlocked let's just find out let's see how many times I unlocked my phone today already I have this app called space and it tracks usage and, and unlocks and okay so I've unlocked my phone 42 times today it's just uh it's twelve like, thirty eight. Yeah. <laughs> and I've used my phone one hour and fourteen minutes. Uh and I remember if I recall, I didn't even touch my phone today until uh must have been eight around eight fifteen is when I touched my phone, try not to touch it right away in the morning. So from about yeah, about three hours I've it's like I don't even know why I open my phone sometimes. And I've turned off the notifications too. So uh, back to your point. Yeah, I grab my phone consuming content. Usually it's not for any purpose. It was, uh, or sorry, and it was to distract myself from something that I probably should have been spending more thoughtful time on. And I know lately I've been, I have phone addiction. It's bad. And the content is the culprit. It's like, I'm so addicted to it. It's like they said the dopamine fix, right? It's been proven. I think Tim talks about it too. So you just, because you, and and the biggest issue with that is, like, if you're checking your phone and reading email, who gives a shit? Like, email doesn't even matter. That's not work. But it's that creative work, the cognitive analysis, the the flow that we always talk about, as you know, like, when people get need to get into the deep state. Man, that destroys it. Like, the phone destroys it. And that's that's why I don't think I've been adding value for the past, like, six months in terms of my, my work. Because I don't go into flow hmm. except because of this guy and just distractions. I want to ask you one last question before we wrap it up. Yeah. How... Critical is exercise in re removing yourself out of depression. Oh, big time. Like for anything, I think everyone should be exercising. Like, I, I, and I know I sound like, because this is like what every person in every podcast says, like Tim, Ro Joe Rogan, who has like the most powerful kick from Taekwondo. But uh, yeah, exercise is super important. I used to be like a super giant kid. Like I'm 5'7", I used to be 90. 91 kilos at my worst. So uh, I've learned and also within my own family to see how important health is for not just the physical, but yeah, the mental. Because uh, it just, yeah, I mean, scientifically it's proven. And you just feel better about yourself. You feel active. I'm not talking about trying to get to look like a six pack and all that, but just working out every day for even 15 minutes, man, it's, it's I think it is really important. Um, and it's, yeah, the mental leads to the physical, right? Well, Tam, yeah. thank you for spending some time with me this morning if you find yourself in saigon and you'd like uh a great coffee you can come to saigon and Siblings. cookies 
soon. <laughs> and uh, briefly, the uh, Modern Hustle, do you have a cafe there as well, or is it just more like a concept store? No, there's there's like a proper espresso bar there, and we have beer on tap, but it's and a lot of much more retail. It's like five times bigger than this place, and it's uh, it's mainly an event space too, though. And if your podcast ever gets released, what's the name of it again? Uh, Level Up. Okay. Yeah, that's it. I can guess from the name. Uh, well, thank you so much, and uh, best of luck. All right. Growing these businesses. Arigato. Doitashimashite. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>